So welcome everyone to our instructor training class meeting for uh, introduction networks. We're going to talk a little bit about chapter three today. Um, I'm going to go through it fairly quickly because chapter three is pretty simple and then we're going to hit chapter four pretty quickly too because it is also fairly simple. But I want to talk a little bit about um, chapter three anyway because it is most of it you could understand, but one of the things I want to stress in this particular chapter, especially for you with students, is making the good analogies of how we do communicate using rules and how language is governed by rules. Um, I always use in my class the example, I look at them and go, huh? And I ask them, I say, what did I just do? And they will know, they say, well, you asked a question or you're confused because there was a rising inflection at the end of my huh. And that is because we have rules in language that force us to, and many of them we don't even understand, we don't even know, we just, we learn them as, as part of growing up, that in rising inflection, which, by the way, I believe, if I'm correct, and I've been told correctly, that is, uh, symbolizes a question or um, not understanding something in every language except for Chinese. I do not know Chinese, so I cannot absolutely guarantee that. Um, but using analogies like this, like the um, normal letter where you've got a piece of data, here's your data, and that data has headers on it, you know, who is it addressed to, um, the recipients, and then looking at taking this data and encapsulating it into a packet, and that mail is in fact the packet. These are analogies that students already, well, they somewhat know because some of the students have never sent a letter in their entire life, um, but it is something that they should be vaguely familiar with if nothing else. It's funny how this analogy probably won't work in five years or 10 years um, because there won't be, you know, honestly think about the last time you sent an actual letter to somebody. Um, I can't think of one to be quite honest, other than a Christmas card. So um, these are analogies that are useful, but will be definitely changing as we move forward uh, with our students. I do want to talk about um, the rules here. We, we talked a little bit about how two devices communicate with each other. We talked about the fact that for a network, you needed a series of items. You needed a, I always tell my students, for a network, you need, you know, something to share. You need a media or medium, which we'll talk about in chapter four. And then, of course, you need some type of protocol or these are just rules, rules for ways to communicate, ways for you know, just like one of the good examples in U.S. is, uh, you know, we drive on the right side of the road. We uh, should be using signals to turn right and left. Um, not everyone does, but they should. And in fact, one of the things you can use an example is that someone does not signal and makes a turn. It can cause an accident because they didn't follow the protocol or the rule that is needed to ensure proper driving and proper communication. Same thing with computers. We have rules that allow us to communicate between host and between devices. That's the whole role of protocols. The one we're gonna deal the most with is TCP IP. And they talk a little bit about that here. This is actually the TCP IP protocol model. And I always say ATN or ATN or NITA, N-I-T-A, if you wanna do it from the bottom up but the application layer, transport layer, internet layer, and network access layer. These are the four layers of the TCP IP model. Your students will need to learn those four layers and you will need to learn them because they're very important. And we're gonna learn a little bit later how these four layers map to the seven layers of the OSI model. Now, why is TCP four layers and the OSI model which was developed in the 80s, seven layers. Anybody know why they don't match exactly? So we've got two models here. We've got, oops, I got click in the right place here. I've got, you know, the TCP IP model, and it is four layers. And I've got the OSI model of communication, and it is seven layers. I always just thought TC, TCIP just condensed it. They just took four, five, six, and like or no, six, seven, seven, five, seven, six, seven, seven. Yeah, seven, six, five, and then one, uh, one and two. Right. The reason, honestly, is 
this is a working protocol stack and a working model. So you can call this a working model. And the OSI model, even though there is technically an OSI protocol stack, nobody ever used it really. Um, this is a theory. This is a theoretical model. So in a working model, you're exactly right. What they did is, plus you got to understand, TCP/IP predates the OSI model by almost 20 years. So the working model doesn't exactly match the theoretical model, and that's important because even though we use the OSI model in our discussions, in fact, it's really funny. I was just at a, a big Veterans IT Awareness meeting, and I was talking with a, a head person in Cisco SOC in the Security Operations Center, and one of the things they really talked about is, you know, to be able to work in a SOC, to be able to do that job, you've got to have a very firm understanding of the layers of the OSI model and how things move about in that model simply because you need to look where attacks are coming from, where packets are coming from, be able to look at, and that's one of the things in this chapter, we have the Wireshark lab, to be able to look at Wireshark and say, okay, what's the source MAC address? What's the destination MAC address? Looking at those types of items so that you can see what's going on in a communication. We'll talk more about this, but that's really the reason, because this is a real world working model, and the OSI model is a theoretical model. Here's some of the different protocols that work at the different layers of the OSI model. Um, you, when you look at TCP IP application layer protocols or things like HTTP, HTTPS, DNS, DHCP, FTP, TFTP, et cetera, um, at the transport layer, you have TCP and UDP. And then at the internet layer, which is analogous to the network layer of the OSI model, you've got IPv4 and IPv6, ICMP, et cetera. And then down here in the network access, which is data link and physical, you've got your actual physical protocols. Now, here's the beauty of TCP IP. As we look at the model, and you see here again, it started in 1965, so it's been around a while, or 69. So it's been around a while, basically. 40, almost 49 years, because I was born in 69. But here we have the protocol suite. And the suite is, when you look at a, a protocol suite, and I always say, kids today, they got it so easy, because back in my day, we had to learn TCP IP and IPX, SPX. Um, but of course, today, all we need to know is TCP IP V4 and V6. But a suite of protocols is a group of protocols working together to perform the communication process. Now you can see all these here, all the different protocols, and you can click on them and see what their, their purpose is. It's good for you and for your students to know these, especially the big ones. Um, you will eventually, before things are all over with, you'll need to know that HTTP runs on uh, TCP, and you'll need to know things like DNS runs on UDP and TCP, depending upon whether it's a server to server communication or if it's a client to server communication. SMTP is TCP, et cetera. So I have to learn how these, what particular transport layer protocol, these application layer protocols depend upon. And that's an, an important thing about the layered model too, is the layers depend on the layers below them to provide services. They don't know, however, really what those layers are doing below them. They're unaware of what's going on down here. They're just gonna receive what the data once the packet has had its or has had its headers removed and trailers if it happens to have a trailer. So we see all these here. Um, I always am a little bit hesitant to say that routing protocols are layer three protocols, but that is where they put them there. So let it be what it is, that's what they say. Here we have an example of encapsulation, and this is just like the letter. You've got data, which could be a request from a web client uh, or a request that's come from a web client to a server sending back information. And so it comes across, here's the web page we requested, that becomes the data. And then you're gonna get a TCP header added to that data. And that is the uh, transport layer of the TCP IP model. You're gonna get an IP header, which is the network layer of the IP model or network access layer. Then you're going to get a data link header, which is this the um, excuse me the, the network access layer here. It becomes ones and zeros, and then when it's received on the opposite side, it it is de-encapsulated. So in other words, it goes through the reverse process. So you'll look here at Ethernet. It looks to see if this is the client's uh, MAC address. Then it checks if it's destined to the correct IP address. 
that looks to see what protocol is being used, and that tells it what application layer protocol to pass the information up to. In this case, it must have come from a TCP port 80. Therefore, it will be passed up to whatever process, was, whatever port was associated with the original request. This is how communication takes place on a network. Now, I'm going to go over here and we can talk about all these standards. You can look at those yourself. I'm not going to spend a ton of time on those. But here, here's an example of the two models side by side. You've got the theoretical OSI model on the left and the real-world model, TCP model on the right. So you've got application, presentation, and session. Transport network data link and physical widget. If you want to remember from top to bottom, it's all people seem to need data processing uh, from layer seven to layer one. Or if you want to go from one to seven, please do not throw sausage pizza away. Uh, again, a funny thing, I had someone the other day who works for a, a large bank who has moved into a SOC level two position and one of the things that he was actually doing as part of his study is they were asking him questions about different layers of the OSI model where things were taking place, which is kind of cool. Um, just to know that that's still a viable skill. And he's like, you know, I remember you teaching me 15 years ago the, the seven layers of OSI model, and, and I'm still using it today. And I'm like, yep, that's that's that is really cool. Now on the right, um, the application layer uh, it performs all three functions of the application presentation and session layer. Transport and transport map one to one, internet maps to network, and then network access maps to the data link and physical. Now, one of the cool things you will find about TCP/IP is that at this, these two layers right here, from the beginning, TCP/IP never made any specifications that were absolutely required at these two layers. It said as long as you meet the requirements of the network access layer, in other words, you perform the functions of the data link and physical layers of the OSI model, which is access control, um, physical addressing with some type of address, and then converting into the correct format to go on a media or medium, we don't care. We'll run it. And that's one of the reasons why TCP IP became so um, predominant is the fact that it would run on anything because they did not specify this particular layer. Now, why do we want, a, want to use a a layered model. One is it does help us with number one, the language of what we speak. So if I look at you and say this is a network layer device, you know it's a layer three OSI device and you know it does routing, that it deals with what's called logical addressing. If I look at you and say, hey, this is an application level device, you know it's something that works at layer seven or if you're, uh, uh, you're, you're talking about TCP IP, it can work at layer seven, six, or five. It does allow vendors to work together. So, you know, you say things have to do certain tasks at layer two. Well, you're going to make sure your device works like it's supposed to at layer two. It is supposed to be easier to learn. Um, first couple of times I did OS, the OSI model, I did have to kind of look at it and go, hmm, okay. So the presentation layer does it. Uh, okay, well, whatever. Um, but, you know, it does give you a, a little easier way to learn things. And this is what I talked about earlier, the difference between a protocol model and a reference model. So this, TCP IP, is a real world protocol model, whereas OSI is a reference model. Both have their place, both are used extensively in the networking world, okay? Um, I would say you really just have to know both. You have to know both of these models and how they map to each other, because we're gonna be talking about them predominantly as we move throughout all of our networking careers. Now, where do some of these newer protocols, like what Google's using and some of these other ones, you know, that you see in Wireshark pop up, where does that kind of fit in? Uh, it really depends. Like, which one are you talking about from Google? I mean, I'm glad you mentioned Wireshark because I want to pull it up real quick. Uh, well, that's it. It's what uh, I can't remember now. What is it? SSDP we've seen and SSDP. And a couple One thing of other I want you to do, uh, let's go Google SSDP. That's Chromecast traffic. Uh, uh, okay. Service simple service discovery protocols. Okay. 
So I would say oh, as Chrome as, must blow that out across the network like crazy. It might very well do it. Because we don't have any Chromecast like on the network, but man, uh, it, there's a lot of SSDB traffic I see in Wireshark. Um, oh, I, I could if I hadn't shut down the ver the I'll, VM. I'll, I'll start right here. Let me do a ca oh no, I got to do an interface. Let me let me select an interface. Man, I got so many interfaces. Because we were working on um, we set up a spam port. There was. Send everything through our wrap and let me go up here and show SSDP. See if I can't SSD. Yeah. Uh, I just saw it. Give me just a second. I'll find one. There it is. SSDP. Um It is using UDP, so it is a, an application layer protocol. You can see how you can kind of see here because you can see that it's mm -hmm. running. You see that it's running. Here's our Ethernet information. So here's our source and destination MAC addresses. Here is, it's also run, this is uh, using IPv6 in this case. Um, it's using UDP. And then we got down here, this is Windows, this is peer name address resolution protocol. So this SS. DP is not Chrome. This is actually Microsoft. I haven't made some uh, it's That's right, it's Windows 10. It's UPnP. It's Universal Plug and Play. So it's going in okay. and trying to find UPnP uh, host. It's used. We use it a lot on. Uh, I'm trying to think of where I've seen uh, UPnP. I've used on like my Xbox One. To connect. Yeah, I was going to say a lot of media servers yeah, and stuff it uses use it. Plex servers. It's for Plex and for different media servers. I guess that makes sense. All the win all the new Windows 10 images exactly. were just redid, and it was looking for updates. And that's exactly. Yeah, I was just wondering because some to, to me what where it, where it gets confusing, which I've, I'm starting to get used to seeing everything. It's like, <clears throat> but the students, especially for mine, they're high school students. So right. when we're we're looking like at the protocols and they see it. Even though okay, it's using UDP, I've never, I don't even understand personally why like the protocol doesn't say UDP. It's, I mean, it, it, I don't know. I guess that's because, good. because here's why. Uh, that that is an excellent question. Okay, so let's go down here and look at uh, TLS. Okay, so here's TLS, right? Mm -hmm. Which is basically SSL connection. So this is an SSL connection that I've got to some 64, which is. Probably my Google Drive is syncing right now, so probably my Google Drive, all right? But notice, in this, and let me go back to, let me go back to this right here real quick, okay? Um, well, if I can find it. Let me minimize this. So, you see these layers we have here. I'm going to go back one more. I'm going to go back to our actual real-world model we got application, transport, internet, and network. So you look at these layers and where different protocols sit on these layers. When we look at Wireshark with TLS, you're going to see that TLS is a protocol that is riding on top of TCP. So it is actually above TCP. So we would call it an application layer protocol. Notice how it says HTTP, application data protocol is HTTP. So it's riding on TCP, and you'll see the source port's 443. That's the port for HTTPS. And then that, this is this is the transport layer information. Okay, here's the internet information because it shows the source and destination IP addresses. And then here is the network access information with the source and destination. And in fact, you can see that I'm going to a Cisco device, and I'm a Dell computer. Because the uh, MAC address, the first 48 bits, are the organizational unique identifier, which identifies who the company is that owns that MAC address. And then the last 48 bits are the serial number. And you'll see how Wireshark automatically tries to convert those to um, the company. So the reason TLS shows as TLS is because it is, in fact, an application layer protocol that rides on top of these other protocols down at the lower layers. Okay. Yeah, that, make, that makes more sense. I, I, I never really 
delved into it to try to think of how to properly, I guess, explain it to some of them. Well, and that's, that really is the key. When you're looking in here, uh, let me see if I can find some HTTP traffic. Uh, that's all SSDP. Let me see if I, let me actually start another capture. And let me just open up a new web page and go to Bella News. Okay, so there's a bunch, whole bunch of HTTP traffic. All right, so uh, let me do this first. I'll show you something cool. I'll do it. Let's say DNS. All right, so look at this. Here's a standard query, and let's see what we're looking for here. So we've got a DNS query, and we're doing a standard query, and it should be looking. Uh, that's did the ad service for Google. Let's see if I can find the. This is where I open it up, and it has so many Google ads. Yeah, I do like being able to show them that how DNS, how we can track everything with DNS. Yep. And here's <laughs> Bela. Here, here's actually Bela News. So this is the website I went to. Which, by the way, that's a that's a cycling site. If anybody needs to, to know, there's cycling. So, uh, but the DNS. Here's the actual DNS lookup saying, "Hey, where is?" Where can I find velonews.com? And you'll see it's a DNS application layer protocol query that rides on UDP. So this is a UDP request because client to DNS server requests are uh, use UDP. That rides on top of IP. And then that, of course, uh, I'm running Ethernet, so it runs on top of Ethernet. So this is a very clear example of how a protocol uses all of these layers. Here's the application layer, the DNS information, and you can even see what it's doing. This is asking a record is that saying, tell me the IP address for this. And then um, you probably, here's probably the response. There's the next one down. Yep, there's the answer. Look at that. There's the IP address that we used. So in other words, I can show them very clearly. Here's the request to say, how do I get to valonews.com? Using DNS, which rides again on UDP, which again rides on IP, or excuse me, which rides on um, yeah IP, and then it runs on Ethernet. And then the response is you get there by going to this IP address, and that was a response from my DNS server. So you can see how the protocols using Wireshark will teach your students how the protocols work. What is weird is it's upside down or backwards in Wireshark. The Ethernet is first, so the lower level protocols are first going down to the higher level protocols. So um, if your students can learn Wireshark, like I said, it is free. They can go to Wireshark and just download it. Um, you can put it in your entire lab and use it as much as you want. Um, it is a really neat, neat thing to use. And for doing little things like this, just saying, hey, look, take a peek at what we did here. And then we can just look at DNS. Well, it's great for showing them how uh, DHCP works too by doing the uh, the boot P. Oh yeah. Them, yeah. Oh yeah. Just the whole course of that, and then I'll show them how they can how you can tell which uh, encryption algorithm that a site you and you as the client negotiate on because you can follow that stream from pretty much a TC, the beginning TCP to the TLS. Definitely. And here's even you can get into the. Showing them, hey, it's doing a get request for velonews.com. So here's the get for velonews.com. And then, you know, it's going through and getting all that information from the program, which shows the layered model in detail, which is another reason why I like that lab, even though uh, in NetLabs it's a little bit different than what it is on, in your classroom, but it, it's good to show them those types of things. Questions about that? Because I, I do want you to make sure you, you take some time to play with with Wireshark, because it is an excellent, excellent um, program for you to use. So let's talk about what the layer models do. So the application layer, um, the best way I can explain the application layer is it provides services to applications above it. Um, that's really kind of the, the best way to talk about it. Um, the presentation layer provides for common representation. I always tell people if encryption or compression uh, are going to take place, they take place at the presentation layer. The session layer is a weird little beast. It's used for establishing, maintaining, and terminating sessions between um, hosts, doing dialogue control. There's a reason why the TCP IP model combines these three layers into a single thing called the application layer. 
is because not every protocol does these functions, these three, these two functions here. Almost all of them do the application layer function because they do provide some service to an application above them, but they don't necessarily do the presentation and session. Now the transport layer uh, is very important because it is responsible for, um, I call it unduplicated, uh, guaranteed, undu un excuse me, guaranteed unduplicated transmissions between devices. Now saying that, you also have UDP, which is not guaranteed, um, but it does actually segment and reassemble the data. And we'll talk a great deal about what TCP does at this layer. This is a layer that is responsible for uh, a large amount of the work that goes on on the network. <clears throat> the network layer provides a routing path determination between networks and devices. And one of the things I want you to put in your notes about the network layer is it deals with um, it deals with the network layer deals with um, route determination and logical addresses. Now, what I mean by logical addresses, in most cases, I'm talking about IP addresses, right? So, for instance, inside of my particular Wireshark, and I'm not giving anything away, folks. I mean, we're using the internal network here. We've got 10. My IP address is 10.102.10.81. Why am I 10.102.10.81? There's no physical reason that I'm 10.102.10 as my network, okay? This happens to be that's what the network administrators decided for this particular building, for this for our setup. So that is a logical address. It has nothing to do with the physical or the physicality of my machine necessarily. The data link layer deals with framing, media access, okay, um, guaranteed delivery, not guaranteed, um, it's not really deliberately, deliberately, uh, delivery, but air checking, because there's a thing called a checksum down at this layer. Okay. By the way, just real quick, just so you know, the transport layer itself, it also deals with error checking. And people always say, well, how can the transport layer do error checking and the data link layer do error checking? Well, remember what I told you uh, just a little bit ago? I said that each layer provides services to the layer above it and receives services from the layer below it, but it doesn't know what the other layers are doing. So in other words, you can have transport layer error checking using TCP that is completely unaware of the checksum that takes place at the data link layer. And that's how you can have error checking going on in two places. It's different types of error checking. This deals with physical addressing. And for us, and 99.9% .9 of the time since we're using Ethernet, it's MAC addresses or media access control addresses which are 48-bit addresses that are burned into the NIC, all right? And of course, the physical layer I always tell people, guess what? I call it the blue collar worker of the network world. It's a bit pusher, all right? It, it simply uh, puts ones and zeros on the media or medium. And I, it does that based upon whatever meter medium is connected to. So it could be pulses of lights, could be, um, you know, presence or absence of um, uh, a charge. Okay, so all of that is very important for you to understand. Are there questions on those on the on those main layers there? Because remember again, application presentation session. Those are basically uh, provide services to the application. Here's something else I like to tell people, and I'll, I'll let you ask any questions. You'll notice that these first two layers right here are pretty much something you could touch. I can hold a cable, I can touch a net. Now, the data link layer is broken into two sublayers: the logical link control sublayer, or the LLC, and the media access control sublayer. Now, this one is 
basically software that talks to the upper layer network layer protocols. The media access sublayer talks to the network interface card and the physical layer below. But you'll see, once you go past the data link layer, really once you get past the logical link control sublayer, you're actually then in software. Everything up here is software. I mean, I don't know about you, but I've never held an IP address in my hand. But I've held plenty of NICs and, and cables. So that's an important distinction, too, because sometimes when we talk about um, doing um, troubleshooting, we talk about doing layer one, layer two. We're looking more at the, is it plugged in? Is it turned on? Does it have a cable? Um, and then up in here, when we start doing uh, air checking or start, or start doing troubleshooting, it becomes a different beast because we're going to start looking at software. Are there any questions about that? The OSI models, how protocol suites work, it's one of the most important things in the CCNA1 curriculum, okay? So make sure your students do understand or have a pretty good understanding because that's going to show up over and over. I'll give you a great example. I'm studying for the um, CYSA. Uh, CompTIA just come up with a new, they actually just changed one of their certifications. Um, there was CSA Plus. And yeah, they so I'm a security it. analyst. They got sued. Did they really? <laughs> had to put a, yeah, they had to put a Y in there. CSA yeah. was already yeah. I just finished that one. That's why I was yeah. actually behind. Okay. I'm getting ready to take it. Um, man, not too long, but yeah, I've got a book that's got the CSA Plus on it, and I went to the site and saw this, and I was like, what in the heck? You know? And then I, then I realized I had changed it. But uh, when you're studying for this, a lot of the study guides and questions ask you questions about the OSI model and where devices sit on the OSI model. So it's something that is out there and is very important. You know, when you look at exam details and you look at some of those things that are out there, um, you know, good Lord, that's expensive. Woo. You don't have a uh, seat license? Uh, no, I had to, I to find out if we can get a, we can get a voucher. Um, yeah, because I think uh, my voucher they got from me was like $99. Okay, I'll ask. I, the bookstore may be able to get me one. I'll check. But here we have, again, the OSI model of similarities versus the TCP IP model. Um, let's see here. Message segmentation, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on, but one of the reasons we do it is so we don't have to send a huge message out there. Um, also, so we can uh, multiplex. So we can have multiple conversations going across at one time. And that's basically segmenting so that you can. Now, one of the things you can tell your students here is, this server right here has to be able to keep up with these two sets of communications. So how is it going to do it? And it's going to do that through addressing and through the use of ports and protocols. Okay. But we don't send a real, real, another reason for doing segmentation is we don't want to send a huge amount of data and have that big piece of data get over here and be damaged in transit. Then we have to resend the entire thing. If we break it into littler pieces, we can actually send it across and then only resend small pieces if there happens to be a problem. Now these PDUs are something you'll hear a lot about uh, or see, and that is just the name of the information as it's going down in and being encapsulated. So basically anything up here uh, in the application layer we call data. At the transport layer we call them segments, and that is the header, transport header, plus the data. At the uh, network layer or the internet layer, we call it a packet. I've also heard, uh, I've seen this called datagrams before. Okay, so both of those work. So now you've got your network header, transport header, data, and then you've got your frame, and this is where you get your MAC addresses, source destination MAC addresses, and then you've got your CRC at the end, and then at the bottom is bits. So um, BFPS is one of the ways I remember it. Uh, bits, frames, packet segments, datagrams are also there. Sometimes you'll see, depending on where you're studying it from, where you see that. Here's a great example of encapsulation. It's the same one we had before, so I'm not going to show it to you again. And then let's talk a second about network addresses, the network source of destination addresses. Well, the first thing we're going to have um, on many of the networks, and this is not loading right now, but first thing we've got to talk about is the layer two addresses. These are the MAC addresses, okay, the media access control. How do you find a MAC address on a PC? Anybody know? IP config forward slash on. Yep.
and you can find the MAC address of a NIC. I'm not going to show you mine, but if you want to do that on yours, you can do it, and you can find your MAC address. Okay. But that's one of the first things that's on the, in the frame is the destination MAC address. Why do they put the destination MAC address first? Does anybody know? That's where it's going. Okay, exactly right. Plus, what's going to happen is on, especially in traditional Ethernet, it used to be that every machine that saw a frame that went by had to pull it up and look at at least the destination MAC address to see if it was destined for them or not, and then it would chuck it. We don't have to do that anymore because we have switches on our networks, but that is why the frame was designed in that way. You also see that the destination NIC, destination MAC is first, then source MAC, then the source IP, destination IP. So it's reversed. Okay, and again, that's because once it's got through this first check, it should be destined for that machine. Um, there's some exceptions because you can have a destination MAC of all Fs, which is the broadcast. Um, but for the most part, once it makes the first check, it should actually um, be for that device. Now, you notice here what happens as you go through routers is that the layer two addresses get rewritten at every hop, but the layer three addresses do not unless you're using that that we will learn about in semester four in our connecting class. So you'll see here that layer two does change, but layer three does not. Now real world, layer three will probably change right here too because we're gonna do NAT. Um, but again, that's, um, for those of you who can see my camera, you won't be able to see it on the recording, but these are not the droids you're looking for. You know, these are not the droids you're looking for. Move along. All right, um, we will learn that later, young, young Padawan. <laughs> It is funny how these things build on one another and how down the road we'll come back to something and you'll suddenly go, ah, okay, but now I see what goes on. Because it does, you have to kind of learn it in layers, so to speak. So here we have communicating with a device on the same network. If it's on the same network, you can actually send it directly. So you can see here the destination MAC address is the MAC address of the FTP server. The source MAC address is the source of the PC. And here we have um, source IP address, destination IP address, and then there would be, by the way, a transport layer header that would be TCP with a source port and a destination port. So depending, this is FTP, it's so port 21. Um, but they're not showing that portion right here right now. We'll see more of that later. But if it's local, you can send it directly to the MAC address. Now, one of the things we'll learn about is a protocol called ARP. ARP, or Address Resolution Protocol, Okay, let me throw this in here because it's important. Address uh, resolution protocol is a protocol that finds a an a MAC address Mac from Mac. a known IP address. So if the user sitting at PC one were to put in FTP 192.168.1.9 and did not already have in the MAC address table of the PC the MAC address of that device, which by the way, if you ever want to see your MAC address table, just take, run a command prompt and do the command ARP-A and it will show you the local MAC address table that you have on your, on your PC. So ARP-A will show you all the the ones that you've learned. Dynamic means that you've learned it via ARP. So it's sent out an ARP request. So what happens is, since I don't know the MAC address, I can't put the frame together, but I know the IP address. So when this happens, PC1 will send out an ARP request. Actually, it broadcasts an ARP request. Well, that broadcast would come over here to the switch and go out this port, this port and this port, and it would be stopped by the router because by default, routers do not allow broadcast to go through them. This FTP server would see that and would send an ARP reply saying, oh yeah, by the way, yeah, that's my, this is the MAC address that goes with that IP address. Then PC1 can create this header at the data link layer. Without ARP, it wouldn't work, okay? So before you can send anything using Ethernet, you've got to know the destination MAC address. The address resolution protocol is used to find 
that MAC address if you don't already know it. Okay. Now, here's where an issue comes in. What if you're trying to get to a web server way over here? Ah, uh, the life of a packet. Yep. If PC1 sends an ARP request, it's going to be broadcast. It's going to come over here and go out here, go out here, and go out here. And it is saying, who has the MAC address associated with 172.16.1.99? None of these devices will respond because they are all on this 192.168.1 network. The router, what the router will do is the router will say, hey, that is an ARP request for a network that is not local. The only way you're going to get to that is to come to me. So guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to do a proxy ARP reply. In other words, it's when the router responds to an ARP request for a remote host. Now notice, the destination MAC address now is the MAC address of the router. And so the router is saying, in order to get to this web server, come to me and I'll figure out how to get there. And then the router will use its routing tables to route. And we'll learn more about how routing takes place. But at layer two, you can't build this frame to send it until you know the destination MAC. Well, the broadcast cannot go all the way through this network to get over here. So the router says, I'll proxy art that for you. Just send it to me and I'll take care of it. And then it'll come in and it will actually go over to R1. Very important concept right here. Any questions on that? Okay, none at all. That's pretty much it for uh, chapter three, folks. Any questions? Now, here's what I'm going to do in chapter four. I'm not going to spend much time at all because this is all about layer one, layer two. The one thing I will tell you about is this. Um, I think I mentioned this before, but you've, have any of you heard of the... Um, uh, I think I talked to you about it, but the um, electrical, using electrical outlets for uh, network connectivity, or using the electrical lines for networks. And I'd always, yeah. I, I'd always kind of poo pooed that, but somebody told me they lived in New York City and that was the only way you could get a decent connection in, a, in an apartment because there were so many thousands of wireless devices. Oh, take a look here. Look at what we're doing. We are taking the OSI model. We're encapsulating information on the sending end, de-encapsulating it on the destination end. The physical layer is responsible for making it ones and zeros. And I will go ahead and tell you that probably everybody on this line knows more about electricity and electronics than I do. Um, you should have seen me this past, it wasn't this week, but last week, trying to figure out the right rack PDUs for my data center. I never knew that there were so many different types of electrical connections, connectors in my life. Um, but there's a bunch, folks. C19, <laughs> C13, Nemo. I thought I'd go insane just trying to figure out what I needed to get. Um, but I finally went with Nemo 520 because that's what everything <laughs> pretty much has. Um, and I needed at least 15 amps per, per circuit. So. Um, but on the physical layer, we're going to convert it into either electrical signals, light pulses, or some type of RF or, you know, frequency modulating, FM, uh, pulse modulated, AM, um, something of that nature in order to get it onto whatever cable or media you're using. The, here's who makes the standards, basically ISO, EITA, ITU, IEEE. Those are the groups that are responsible for. And notice how it does. Half of the data link, why do you think that is? What did I tell you about the data link layer? Well, I mean, you're, I guess if you're talking your NIC card, and half of that is going to be the um, the connector on your on your physical wire. <laughs> yep, and also, remember the data link layer is broken into two parts, right? Yeah. This media access control sublayer deals with more physical layer components. 
even though it is a data link layer. So the media access control deals with how you get onto the physical media. So that is one half of the data link layer. And what's the logical link control do? It deals with how you talk to the network layer. And that's why the data link layer has kind of a strange function in that it sits there in the middle between hardware and software. Here we have Manchester encoding, which shows the, the presence or absence of voltage determines whether or not you are one or the other, uh, whether you are one or a zero. Uh, there are different ways of doing encoding. It can be the presence or absence. It can be a change in the um, uh, a change forces it to the, the bit, the flip. Uh, I always tell people, somebody said the other day, you know, computers are so smart. I said, actually, they're extremely dumb because um, all they know are ones and zeros until you start talking about artificial intelligence and all that. Um, but we also have this. But one of the things you need to look at is it's always some value within a time slot. Even if we look here, when we look at modulating waves with FM or AM, we need to look and say it's some value within a time slot. And that is important because if that particular time slot gets messed up, then we have some issues. Or if there's any type of signal degradation, we have issues. Here's units of bandwidth, bits per second, kilobits per second, megabits, gigabits, terabits. All these Ooh, are the terabit. Yeah, I wish. Yeah. <laughs> I'd give anything to have gigabit Ethernet at the house for my internet connection. Yeah, you and me both. Here's something I do want to talk a little bit about. And this is the concept of throughput. Okay. Throughput. And okay. So when we look at throughput. We're going to look at the amount of information. So let's look at, I'm going to throw another concept up here. Let's look at bandwidth. So we got an entire bandwidth, right? So anybody ever seen a fire hose? Bandwidth. Yep. All right, seen yep. fire hose. Well, if you turned on a fire hose or you got a four inch fire hose, you got four inches of bandwidth for the water going through it. Okay. The throughput is the amount of water going through that fire hose at a given time. So just because you got a four inch fire hose doesn't mean you turn it all, you might, well, you usually do turn it all the way on. Let's say you don't turn it all the way on. Let's say you turn it on and only run a portion of the water through it. So you only gonna run two inches worth of water through this four inch fire hose. Well, your bandwidth, your maximum bandwidth is four inches of water. But your throughput, is only going to be two inches of water. All right. Now, throughput includes in our networking worlds, we have a bandwidth. So let's say our bandwidth, our maximum bandwidth is 100 megabits per second. So that's the max we can possibly do. Throughput is what is being sent through at a given time. And throughput includes both data and control traffic. Good put, which is a term you don't hear very often, is data only. So it's the information, the actual data going through without the control. Because not every bit of your throughput is data. Some of your throughput is actually control. It could be read transmissions. It could be uh, broadcast art requests, art replies. Those have absolutely nothing. To, you know, they don't have any real data in them per se to send. You know, go to a web page. They're just an art request, art reply that support being able to build the frame. So the throughput is all how much is going through at a given time. Bandwidth is the maximum, and good put is how much is the data itself going through. By the way, we almost never reach our full bandwidth. Almost never, no matter what, because of the fact that you do have retransmissions, you have issues, you always have things that take place that will keep you from getting full um, bandwidth. Another term they throw in here is latency, and that's the amount of delay uh, from one um, given point to another, because latency is a measure of uh, every device you go through introduces latency, something to learn about. 
let's just quickly go through here. I'm going to spend just a little bit of time here looking at some of the characteristics of copper. Most of this you've seen. Um, big thing about copper is it is very susceptible to EMI. Uh, what makes EMI, folks? Well, motors, electrical, uh, electromagnetic devices, um, nuclear weapons make really good EMI. Not that anybody cares about whether or not the network's up and if there's a nuclear weapon go off, but they make great EMI. Um, in fact, if you want to if you want to scare yourself to death, read a book called One Second After, um, and it's a book that is about uh, basically the detonation of two large nuclear weapons 50 miles up in the atmosphere, one over the western part of the U.S., one over the eastern part of the U.S., and what would happen to the U.S. if uh, if an EMP attack actually did take place. It's pretty pretty scary stuff. A good um, solar flare would do that. Oh yeah, a good solar flare would too. We had a pretty big one not long ago. Uh, but the sun's actually been pretty quiet lately, knock on wood, um, which is unusual because it's supposed to be in a period of high um, high solar flare activity. But for some reason, it's been pretty quiet. Carmen, do you have a question? Yeah, what's the percentage of uh, good good could to uh, to the thorough Is there a percentage uh, difference in them? Say it again, the difference between good put and throughput? Yes, what percentage rate is it good and what percentage is uh, just the, uh, the other stuff? Okay, uh, the question was what is the percentage of good put versus throughput? That is totally dependent upon what protocol you're running, um, what kind of underlying data link layer technology are you using. Um, I would say in traditional Ethernet, in traditional Ethernet it was around 80 percent. Um, I don't know in micro-segmented Ethernet. Um, you know, we don't really have, this day and age, we don't have collisions anymore um, on our networks, or well, we should not have collisions on our networks because um, of switching. Uh, it can happen, but it's usually something's gone horribly wrong. Um, so I would say traditionally around 80 percent, and I would say if you're getting um, that 80 percent good put or uh, throughput? I'd say throughput, throughput, and then out of that good put would probably be something like 65 percent, okay. 60, 65 percent. Curious, just curious. Yeah, and I don't have exact numbers on that. I'm some of that I'm just kind of pulling out of the air, but just that's just from looking at different, um, different protocols and looking at different things over the years. That's good. Thank you. I tell you something that is interesting that people don't realize is that. You get less throughput on a wireless network than you do on a wired network um, because of the access method used on wireless networks, um, which is kind of interesting. It's going to be very interesting to see if you've been, again, I keep talking about 5G because I, I'm hoping it to be the savior of my internet connection at the house. Um, but I'm thinking that 5G is really going to be something that kind of blows the doors down on, on the speeds that we can get. I'm actually going to stop here, folks, because the rest of this, I think, is pretty pretty self-explanatory, just cabling standards. The one thing I will tell you is you do need to learn these, um, the difference between um, a 568A, 568B cable. I just memorized white, orange, orange, white, green, blue, white, blue, green, white, brown, brown, which is 568B. And if I need to make 568A, you just swap the greens and the oranges. Um, that is something students kind of need to know. Um, being able to make your own Ethernet cable is a skill that will save you a bunch of money. Um, if you've ever had to go buy a cable, you'll know what I'm talking about. Um, you can, you know, you can spend a lot of money on cable. So here's five. Yeah, you can too. Yeah, especially now. I used to be really good at making cables. Um, again, I keep talking about the accent, but after that, uh, my hands don't work as well as they used to, so I have to fight them a little bit more. Um, but still, uh, it's, it's a great skill to have. So 568, white, green, green, uh, white, orange, blue, white, blue, orange, white, brown, brown. And that is 568A. And one of the things you will notice, if you've done it right, there's never a striped color beside a solid, or uh, two striped colors beside each other, two solid colors beside each other. So, and then you said that you swap the greens and oranges. Exactly. Here's 568B, white, orange, orange, white, green, blue, 
Oops, excuse me. Okay. Should be white, uh, yeah, white, green, blue, white, blue, green, white, brown, brown. The only difference between the two is that you're swapping and I'm having difficulty putting stuff in here, but you just swap the greens and oranges between A and B. That is literally the only difference between the two. So. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. And like I said, you, it's right here, but you can see it too. The other thing is notice the tab is away from you. A lot of people have trouble with that. You know, one of the things, uh, let me see if I got, I think I got it. I may not be able to get it where you can see it with this camera, but when you look at, obviously, um, when you look at a RJ45 connector, there's a tab side and a non-tab side. Well, when you actually lay in the cables, you need to have the tab away from you so that pin one is on the left. So when I'm looking at pin one, if I was making a 568A, I would put on this left side, white, white green, green, or white, orange, blue, white, blue, orange, white, brown, brown. So make wow. sure when you make your cables, the tab's away. And you put the same standard on both sides if you want a straight through cable, okay? Which basically means that pin one, it goes to pin one on the opposite side. If you want a crossover cable, you'll make one side 568A and the other side 568B because that will take pins one and two on one side and make them go um, to the opposite pin three and six on the other side. So it's, you can actually create a crossover that way. Um, we used to have to make a bunch of crossovers because if you connected two switches back to back or if you connected a host to a host, you would need a crossover cable. Most devices today will do what we call autocross or MDIX. Uh, it will autocross. And so really we've got to where we don't even use cross crossover cables much. If in your lab you have older devices, uh, some older switches, some older routers like 2800, 25, well, 28, 26, um, you may have to actually use crossover cables if you're going from router to router. Modern 2900s, anything above that, 2900 routers, 2960 switches, they will autocross. So you really don't have to use crossover cables anymore. Um, it's another skill that students are losing because they just plug your cable in and it works. Um, so not necessarily a bad thing, but it's something that they'll eventually, if you need to teach them this because they'll eventually go out there in the real world somewhere and find something that's not working because somebody put, you know, a straight through cable in a device that doesn't support autocross. And then they'll, they fix that and then they look like superheroes and it's really a simple fix. Um, I think that's where I'm going to stop here. And like I said, the rest of this you can kind of read through yourself on chapter four. And let me stop the recording. And ask you.